بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. I'm Brother Ali. You, you. This is the Travelers Podcast. I'm wearing the same clothes that I was wearing on the intro and outro last week. That's because when you're hearing this, if every good thing goes according to plan, I'm actually in the Gambia, West Africa, with my family, uh, celebrating, taking out the last week of Ramadan, and then into the Eid, spending time with our teachers and our spiritual guides and our spiritual lineage in the Gambia, West Africa. And so uh, I'm recording these ahead of time. Um, also, uh, the end of Ramadan is coming soon, and so for those of you who are uh, fasting or are celebrating or commemorating in any way, I want to wish you a blessed Ramadan and a blessed Eid. Uh, a lot of people that, aren't, that don't identify as Muslim fast with us in solidarity and to try to experience uh, some of the benefit and blessing of Ramadan. And so for all of you that do that, I really pray that the benefit and blessing reaches you. And um, we're very grateful to our allies and our friends and our family that rock with us, you know. This, particularly in this time, it really means a lot. It's interesting one time uh, when, uh, you know, the last president, the guy with orange hair, when he, uh, when he was elected and he said he was going to do a registry of Muslims, there was a pretty well-known, like, prominent couple in the Twin Cities that came to visit me and my wife in our house because they said, if, if this man makes a registry for Muslims, we're going to sign it out of solidarity. And I was like, whoa, that's dope. That's gangster because they might put us in camps or something. Like, you just never know, you know. Uh, and they said, we just want to, can we come over for dinner and you explain to us the basics of Islam? Just so we know, you know what I'm saying? And I, I think they wanted to know. Like, there's tough questions. There's been misinformation and lies about Islam, and they wanted to know what's up with that. So we talked through everything, and they asked the tough questions, and I love when people ask tough, tough questions um, with the genuine intention to gain in understanding, not because you think you already know the answers, but you know to really have those conversations. And we got to the end, and uh, it was a man and a lady, and the man said, he turned to her and he said, uh, I'm doing this for real. She's like, what do you mean? He's like, I think I've always been a Muslim. And she was like, are you serious? And so he became a Muslim that night. Um, you know, and she didn't, but it's like, man, our, we, we really appreciate and love our allies, friends, family. Uh, it really means a lot. This episode is very special. Last week, we talked to Unjust, who is the producer, animator, illustrator, the visual creator for the new album that we're rolling out called Love and Service. Um, and we talked about his history, our history together. We talked about the making of this album. The album comes out April 26th. We've rolled out a few songs already. And this is one of the main chapters of my life. This is one of the, my chapters of my life's work. And I'm really, really grateful for it. And people always ask how to support. The best way to support artists is to buy their art. And uh, we've got CDs that are almost sold out, tapes that are almost sold out. By the time this comes out, those might be sold out. But go to BrotherAli.com. There are deluxe vinyl packages. Just is the one, or Unjust, or Justin. He's the one who made all the music. He's also the person that animated and illustrated the vignettes, the, the short films, uh, that will eventually culminate in a 40-minute film version of this album called Love and Service. And he also uh, did the packaging. And we spared no expense in mixing this album, in mastering it, in uh, the production of it. Like it's beautiful vinyl packaging. The paper is beautiful. The, everything about it, the weight of the record, the particular, it's just, I'm, I'm, we did exactly what we wanted to do. And as an artist, that's the most you can ask for. And you want for when you put that kind of art into the world for there to be somebody there to be part of it and support it and to listen to it because that's an important part of the process and that's you and so you have a major role in allowing us to do what our hearts feel drawn to do and we're grateful for that and we love you for that so go to brotherali.com uh, you know grab anything over there but I'm telling you the deluxe vinyl of this album we ordered a certain number and we'll probably order more but we're going to decide based on how that goes because honestly we spent a lot of money to make sure that it's deluxe and so you, you know on some level you got to figure out like do people want this deluxe 
or do people want us to just press this on a black record because they only want they they want a cheaper price point? Something tells me we're not going to compromise. What we wanted to we wanted to make it deluxe because this is music that really comes from our hearts. It's a major major chapter of our lives that we put into this project. So uh, that's what we're offering you. Go to brotherali.com and check that out. We're sponsored as always by the Zakat Foundation. Uh, we're sending a million meals to Gaza. Uh, to, to Philistine, to Palestine. It's $5 a meal. We're trying to get the people that listen to this podcast and our music and follow us on social media to provide 5,000 of those meals. It's $5. Uh, there are people that Zakat Foundation has on the ground that have been successful in getting trucks in. It's a constant struggle, but as long as they're struggling to get those trucks in, we're, our part is that we can keep those trucks full and only $5 sends food and supplies and all that kind of stuff to the people of Gaza. So that's what we're doing. So hit the links wherever you see them, zakat.org, Z-A-K-A-T.org. There's a specific link that lets them know that it came from us because they like to know like, oh, brother, these people did this much. And so you can hit that link wherever you see it as well. But ultimately what it's about is getting food to people, to human beings who need and deserve food. Uh, enjoy this episode of the Travelers Podcast with my man Unjust. We're going to talk through each individual song on this project so you get a sense for, I mean, Rock Marciano is on it, Aesop Rock is on it, Casual from Hieroglyphics is on it, Quelle Chris is on it. Um, it's just, as you'll hear, it's a deeply, deeply, every single song has a lot of life and just humanity poured into it. So enjoy this conversation with my man Just. So the album opens with a song called Chapter One, and it's kind of like a thesis statement for what the album is. Yeah, and there's a there's a sister whose voice is on it named Rakaya, um, that she's like a, a well-known Muslim poet in in uh, England, in the UK. And it's crazy because I would like lo always loved her voice. I had never met her before. And I remember thinking to herself, th to myself, she would sound so dope on this album. But I didn't know her and I didn't want to like necessarily reach out or anything like that. But we follow each other on Instagram. And I just happened to be looking at her stories one day. And I saw that she was in a neighborhood near us in Istanbul. And I was like, I hit her and I was like, hey, Salam alaikum, are you in Istanbul right now? She's like, yeah, I'm in Katakoy, which is like, that's the hipster neighborhood. It actually, <laughs> so in Istanbul in general, um, especially on the Asian side, um, they're like traditionally Muslim neighborhoods. Uh, and so like the neighborhood I live in is one of the most traditional ones. There's not bars here. You can buy alcohol in a grocery store, in some of the grocery stores, not all of them. And like people know which ones they are. So like very, very observant Muslims don't even shop in those grocery stores. I do. Cause like a lot of times they have like Jiffy peanut butter or Jif peanut butter, you know what I'm saying? Like a lot yeah, of times yeah. they have brands that my kids miss, you know what I'm saying? But then there are neighborhoods that used to be Christian neighborhoods or Jewish neighborhoods. And a lot of times those will be the hipster neighborhoods. They'll have drinking there, but also like if you go there, the meat is still halal. So like a lot of times we'll go there and like you can get actual Italian food in those places, you know what I mean? So yeah. one of them near us is called Kuz Kunjuk and I, they said that was a Jewish neighborhood. And there are all these places that were like Jewish neighborhoods because Bayezid, the Sultan, when the when the Jews were expelled from Europe, he wrote a letter to the heads of, of the European governments and he said, you've impoverished yourself and you've enriched us. And then he made laws that like the Jews, when they come to, to Turkey, they'll be citizens, they'll be full citizens immediately with a step off the boat. You have to hire them, you have to rent to them, you have to sell to them, you have to buy from them, you have to, they have to be like completely incorporated into Ottoman society. Um, and so there's like these neighborhoods, a Christian neighborhoods. Another one's called Katakoy. Anyway, so she was in Katakoy. And so I was like, yo. So she came through and um, in this room, I was just like, just try saying this, love and service, you know, mercy and light, prescription for life and then that became the the mantra yeah man and it Super came out beautiful it came out beautiful i i had no conception when i made that beat that that's where that would end up but she she gave a real vibe to it that um you know 
harken back to some things that I really love, like some De La AOI type, you know, having her voice on there was really important. So I'm really grateful that you were able to get that done. Yeah, her parents are like really big hip hop heads, like her dad in particular, super hip hop head. So it was really dope. Oh, and I didn't realize. So we, so I'm like, yeah, it's such a, such an honor to finally meet you and everything. And, you know, um, and she was like, she's like, do you not remember? I was at your show. Like she, I, I met her dad and her mom at one of my shows in London and she was there, but she was just probably, you know, a 16 year old, like their daughter or something. Yeah. So yeah. I, I didn't even realize, wow. but that's dope. Wow. So then track two is Ottomans, which that one people have heard. That one had, how many beats did that have? Three? Three. The first one was a beat that I had sampled Fraggle Rock. And uh, that's one of the things that like tickles me. I'm like, ha, 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 he's spitting hard over this Fraggle Rock stuff. Uh, but we also had on that first version, we it serves to mention, we had uh, played around with some guest vocals from an OG from Ohio, Clyde Brown. Um, who I think was an original part, original member of the Drifters. I could be getting that wrong, but he had some kind of crazy legacy. And um, he was a great guy too, just a wonderful person. But I was, I met him in Yellow Springs because when Dave was doing this stuff, it, there was also a musical aspect. Every Sunday the, at, in the back of Rose and Sal's, this vintage store, Fred Yone would bring A-list musicians and put on a free show every Sunday for months. Like mm. I met Bill, I met Bill Murray there, you mm. know, met John Stewart there. And I met this OG Clyde there. And, you know, when we first recorded that version of the song, you were like, this might sound cool with some with OG singing. And I was like, I got just the guy. And he, yeah, I booked the studio uh, in Cincinnati, knocked it out. And, you know, before the record could come out, he, he unfortunately passed, but he, he had lived a, a you know, a, to, to be a nice, to be a good old age, but um, yeah, that was the first version of it. And and this also, I want to say this, like in the nature of us being able to put our hands in each other's like, you know, process, you allowed me to send you beats that I thought would match the record or that I thought mm. like that, you know, would fit in vibe wise. Ottomans was one of those and worthy was one of those where I, where you, we're like, do you have any beats that you would like to hear on this record? Yeah, yeah. No yeah, one's yeah. ever asked me that before. Yeah, I forgot about that. But yeah, I was like, what are you? Yeah, are there beats that you really want to be on here? And I'll figure out how to make a song to them. Yeah, I, it was the two that I sent were Ottomans and Worthy. Mm. And those are two of my favorites, man. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, they're really necessary ones for the record. For sure. Yeah, so Ottomans. And then, but Ottomans was always going to be the first track. You know, what's interesting about that one. I wrote that I wrote that verse because I was watching Locksmith. <laughs> yeah. That's why I said the word locksmith in the verse. The ox of locksmith when I'm in the cockpit. I was like watching Locksmith rap or Lock Locksmith rap. And I was like, man, I need to have something in case I'm ever at Sway and Locksmith is there or something. You know what I mean? Like I need something, I need to rap like that. That was the he was the inspiration for it. Yeah. That's funny because it it ended up on a smooth beat. But yeah. that first beat was like, bow, like, yeah. you know, hard. But yeah. it ended up being the smooth one. Yeah, and was, and we had three options. So we, I think we had all three options. And I think we couldn't decide. Me and you were, we loved them all. Yeah. There was one that I took two of your beats and I made the beat change halfway I through. I love that. I love that. Yeah, and I changed the tempo and I changed the key of one of the beats too so that it would be in. And so, yeah, and then... Um, and then I was like, hey, can you send me the sample from this beat? Send me these vocal samples from this beat. I'm going to put them, I'm going to, I'm going to construct a, an intro out of it. Because, yeah, the light was from... The light was from the second beat, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just let me mess with everything. It was um, so cool. You did such a good job. You did not do one thing whack. And then, and then uh, <laughs> Brendan was actually the one that told us that the one that ended up, the Know Yourself, he's like, that's the one. He's like, these are all cool. This one is special, and he was like, "This should be the first single," mm. and he was right. Yes, he was right. So the the yeah, awaken is basically about the fact that the, rea the the number one reality of life is that we're gonna die, and to base our lives based on that, you know what I mean? Like everything in the material world is gonna leave us, and so it's really about the spiritual path. But what's interesting is that um, I was singing a song from the band 
called When You Awake. That it, like my one of my spiritual te- my primary spiritual teacher is Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, who grew up in Georgia, and he's like a seven year old white man that grew up in Georgia, and he's like, you know, what I mean, he very clearly like loves that kind of stuff. So he's got this song called When You Awake by the band um, that I incorporated in that one. So yeah, I mean, um, I will say that uh, one of the biggest things that I had to overcome from COVID was my, was a fear of mortality. Mm. You know, it, it had set in pretty deep. Yeah. Um, and talking to you and talking um, to Nassim Chappelle, Dave's nephew. Yeah. I know he, Nassim. It was the two of you talking to the two of you helped me get over that. I'm, um, you know, he was like, it's Gary, you know, he gave me the, the whole rundown. Like we don't fear things that are guaranteed. Like, you know, it's guaranteed. You prepare for death. You, you don't prepare. fear death. You, you prepare. Don't, you prepare for it. Right. That's all you can do. Um, yeah. Home, you know, home going. So that so this song helped help me in that regard as well. And I, and I am over it. Like this has been, this last three years has been a lot of healing for both of us. And that was something that from not only from COVID, but from the lack of being able to breathe for eight weeks. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, I had some, some physical, like, you know, reaction to my own mortality, but um, awaken was important for for the for that reason for me. And uh, and also, like, man, I have to like just, I I will say that like for me that song in particular, and uh, so you know, like I have we have these inspirations, and like we're the only ones that know them unless we reveal them. So for me, that one I was thinking about Yasin the ecstatic, like that whole album, mm. where it's like he's tapping into so like being to be ecstatic as a Sufi, as a, for the Sufis, what they meant by that is that they completely lost themselves in the divine presence. You know what I mean? That they're just swimming in love, that they're so connected to, to God that they almost don't exist. And that there's a, that there's a type of like ecstasy of just being so like, they're literally witnessing and experiencing. It's like, they're making love to, now these are things that I don't know anything about. These are just things that you hear the Sufis talk about, and I believe them. Um, And so that's what the ecstatic means. And so Yasin on that particular album is like just doing this high level, intense, lyrical assault about these, these ideas. You know what I mean? So for me, like that's that's what I was I was kind of trying to channel. You sure the ecstatic did. on that one. But for yeah. as much as I've wanted to rap about the spiritual realities, that's to me that's to me that's the my favorite one that I've got to so far is like the level of rhyming and the level of like clarity and like what I, what I'm talking about. To me, that's one of the songs that I've made that I'm most proud of in my catalog is like that song. And I I didn't write it. Like I'd literally sat and like thought of a few bars at a time and just added it, added it, added it, added it. And that, so I didn't really even realize until I got home a day or two later and I was like, oh man, cause you're just thinking about each little bar and you don't hear it as an overall composition until later. You know, that's funny. Cause it's the same way I do the animation It's like, I'm directing every scene. Like these are scenes yeah, that I'm coming wow. up with, like, you know, and it's like, okay, next scene, next scene. Like before I start, I usually have like three or four scenes in my head. Usually mm. one of those is the ending. Mm. Like I know how this is going to, I see it. I, at first I have to see it. Yeah. And then I'll see like three or four pieces and then, then yeah, I'll build the rest as I go scene by scene. Yeah. yeah so connect, and then before you know, it's this crazy connected composition. Yeah. And then I hit one pocket. So I'm not rhyming like y'all seen at all on that song, but there's a part where I get to say truth, not hidden, truth and truth living, and living. truth, giving rhythm, when it fit within it. That's my one little, that's, <laughs> that's a Yasin ish kind of pocket. So then the next one is the collapse. <sighs> yes. And this was Which your famous, be- uh, doing the song after the, after the album is done. Yeah. I always do that. <laughs> I always do that. I had a therapy session about that. I don't think I don't know if I told you about that. <laughs> no. But I had a therapy session about why do I always do one of the like key cornerstone anthems of the album when the song is when the album's completely done. And what I came to is that I don't trust that that I don't feel worthy of if I if I attempt a song like that and it's only adequate. If it's just fine. 
like, I don't think I'm allowed to deliver something that's just fine. Like, I think I have to knock every, but nobody knocks everything out of the park. And so if I do it at the last minute, I don't have time to actually judge it. There's no time to actually sit with the reality of whatever that is. Cause I'm attempting to, I'm, I'm attempting to swing for the, whatever, the bleachers or whatever. You know what I mean? That's what I'm attempting to hit a home run. And so if I don't hit a home run, there's no time to even look at where the ball goes. It's just like, you just got to swing right. the bat. So I, all, I always do that with all of my albums. There's like an there's like a song that in a lot of ways is anthemic to the project that I do when the project is technically over. And then I'm like, no, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is a special one. We already kind of talked about it in length, but, um, I'll say this, that uh, that statement of that song and the video, when I was done and I turned it in, I, I cried. Like, I felt like I gave birth. I felt like, you know, you've said a couple times that, like, some of these songs are songs that were mandatory to come from you. They had to come out of you to fulfill your purpose Yeah. in this life. This song and video is definitely that for me, for all the reasons we discussed earlier. Like, I it was vital to my existence in this go round <laughs> that I personally make this statement. Yeah. I remember when you, when you were like, all right, I'm sending you this video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just like, look, <laughs> look, man, this is the video. <laughs> yeah. It just I mean, had such a, it had such a like heavy, the, yeah. the message of you sending it and then when when i hit play i was just like god shit. like <laughs> oh man yeah yeah like, no man, it, like some of the like the the pig i'm like dude <laughs> i wanted to uh that was my little slight ode to my favorite music video of all time mm. uh slick rick behind bars wow okay that's one of my favorite creative pieces of any kind that i've ever like you see the the collection of animated cells I have, oh, okay. which by which by the way, the reason I choose to surround myself with this stuff is that like if I call myself an animator, you know we're doing things digitally now, but all these somebody leaned on and breathed on and like pressed on to get the ink on there and put their hands and their spirit on, like yeah. you know, yeah, one of those is the joint from Soul Train, you know, wow. like like I got. And I got a gift for you that I'm going to give you when I see you, uh, yeah. one of those. But um, that was so, you know, that video, that slick rig video had the little rat that would show up from time to time and like do a little uh, dance or whatever. Okay. Like, dun, dun, well, dun, why, dun, why, dun, why'd you make it a pig, day. though? <laughs> well, because I, I, I have my theory of like what I think it means, but I'm curious to know from you. Well, to be honest, A, it's. It was the easy representation of capitalism, but more of the reason was that I wanted to show that Zionists are being anti-Jewish. That's what I thought. That's what I that, thought. And because, because the pig is so offensive to Muslims and Jews. Yep. But then also, it. also I, I thought it was like, man, I think some of your dad's like I don't know if he identified like with like socialism or like the Panthers, but that's kind of the always like when I think about your dad, I kind of think about him being in alignment with that stuff and that they would always speak about capitalism as pigs and dogs. Like the yep. pigs, the pigs is there, is there, and it's interesting. So the, they would always say pigs when they talk about their greediness and dogs when they talk about their violence. And their wow, and their like harshness. Yeah. And what's interesting is that, and this is terrifying um but the muslims are, are taught that on the day of judgment our deeds actually are there as like physical manifestations and we actually look like our main characteristics and so for people who were and some of us look like pigs and some of us look like dogs. Like if though if our pig nature or our dog nature, some of us are bovine. Like some of us are like uh, cows. Mm -hmm. Like people that are just constantly grazing and always taking. And you know what I mean. And so that like some of us look like that. Just in, just indulging in comfort, and putting that above everything. 
Yeah. Yeah. Prioritizing that. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah, it's just another one of those connections. But I, I thought that might be the case. That, yeah. That, you know, the, I wanted to show you that you are being so vile. Yes. You are being the vile thing that you don't even fuck with. But that's yeah. who you're, that's what you're doing. That you, was the reason that shows a pig. You've become what you hate. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a trip, man. I was just thinking about the fact that <laughs> that like we both have to live with this. <laughs> like when you were yeah. saying, like Wednesday when this video comes out, I might not have a job anymore. You know what I mean? I might not be. I'm. There's a lot of places I might not get booked ever again. You know what I mean? Like some of the booking agents in my major markets. Like on the last tour, I was saying free Palestine from the river to the sea, and they were like trying to get me to not say that. But they couldn't, and I was already booked, and I was like, I can say what I want to say, but like these are the people that might not book me. You know what I mean? Yeah, and what's I interesting mean, is like, so I'm saying what I'm saying, but then also this video is what it is, and th to those people, that's the new brother Ali video. They don't right, care. They, right. they don't. They don't care that a, the Jewish homie made that. You know what I mean? And for you, and for like you and your world, they th like they don't care that like some indie rap guy you got a chance to you're like making a record with this indie rap guy and he's muslim and this is what he says you know what i mean like in 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 both of our worlds it's going to be like no you said this <laughs> it is it is um and i just love the fact that we're just both like yeah what said what i said mic drop i have to i gotta be tr you know you we have to be true to the sacred and to what's righteous and i do want to like say that like it's been really interesting since October 7th to see how much pushback industry wise, like, and how many hurdles that we've had to deal with because of our shared, you know, view of things. Like there's a company that was really excited to work with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that I know them personally. I was there at the beginning of their whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then October 7th happened. And they like ghosted, they fully ghosted. And what I just trip on is that like, okay, you're taking this stance against this record. Uh, this, uh, you know, pro-Israeli stand of not messing with us. But by doing so, you're hurting an actual Jew that you actually know. Was like they actually, know you. They, they, I was there with you at the beginning, like the beginning and yeah. you are going to now, in the name of whatever you feel is so righteous, you're actually hurting, you know, because I believe they could have helped, you know, or they have released in a position to, but like, yeah, nice stance, buddy. The stance you took hurt until yeah. you know. It's deep, man. And it, and that's what I'm saying. It's like, this is where I'm learning about the idea of, for lack of a better term, allyship from a different perspective, mm -hmm. because I'm in every privileged group. You know what I mean? So I'm usually the one trying to figure out how to be an ally. You know what I mean? This is the one time that I've been like, man. So even for, even the gaslighting of it, like for mm -hmm. you to send me screenshots of stuff that they posted, because they don't say to you. So basically what happened is there's this, there's this distribution company and they do a lot of stuff. And I've worked with them also since the beginning of my career in different capacities. I always had great relationships with them. I also, you know, I don't want to say too much because I want to give away who it is. But... We sat with them, me and Brendan sat with them and played them this music and played them music in general. And they were just like, yeah, goosebumps. This is amazing. You know what I mean? And I told them, I was like, I don't know how big this is going to be. I can't judge stuff like that. But for somebody, this will be very important music to them. Somebody will tattoo this music on their body. Somebody will play this at their wedding. Somebody will have this on their, you know, I just know what it feels like to have something like that come out of me and how it lands on the people that listen to me. This will be somebody's favorite music. And they were like, man, we just got goosebumps. And, da -da. and then that's before October 7th. And then October 7th happens. And also none of the artists that they work with said a mumbling word about anything. But all the business people were posting very like pro-Israel stuff and they were all liking it and commenting on it and things like that. But none of the artists can say a word. None of the artists said anything in any, in any capacity. And then we send them the music that we sat there and played them and they didn't respond and they never even listened to it.
They never even press play. You could see the plays. How many times did they listen to? None. They didn't None. even listen to the music, and they just never responded. And they never say to you, uh, well, we're Zionists and you're pro-Palestinian, or you're not. It's not even that pro but we're Zionists and you're not, and so we're not going to put your music out. They don't say that to you. You know what I mean? And so, I, like, this is what I'm saying. Like, I'm learning for so for you to send me screenshots of stuff that they posted that I never saw, by the way, that mm. I, th that I, I wasn't part of the whatever mm -hmm. close friends list or whatever it is. <laughs> I didn't see those posts. So you sent me posts and it was like, look, this is what they posted. Just for you to be like, hey, this is because of global politics. Like, this isn't them suddenly they don't like the music anymore. You know what I mean? Like just the fact that I felt like I was being gaslit by them and for you to be like, no, this is what they're doing. No. Nope. And what drives me also insane is that you're literally reinforcing all the stereotypes. You're, you're so helping that the narrative of Jews as gatekeepers and all this stuff, like, man, did you just do exactly that? It's interesting. Cause I'm like, man, what if, yeah. I mean, there's all kind of like, intertwined business realities that are connected to that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, mm. I mean, I, I know that there's a whole go round of, so like they also do events and there's a whole go round of their, of their events and of their whole network. And I wasn't booked on any of them. And I'm normally, I'm on a bunch of them. I, I'm not on any of them this year. And again, you know, you can't know, you can't know for certain. I mean, maybe it's just that like, okay, maybe they're waiting for this new music to come out. But I've been on some of that stuff consistently. And in one of those markets, um, in one of those markets, my agent is saying, oh, I'm trying to get you on this, this atmosphere show in that market. And I'm like, okay, if that's what we're, if that's what we're down to is that you're trying to get me on an atmosphere show. You know what I'm saying? Like that's oh again, gosh. nothing, nothing against my, my booking agent. Like I'm saying, like she, man, she, she fights for me, but I'm like, man, if that's where we're at, that's, that's a, that to me, that feels like a confirmation that like they're, they don't want to put me in front of audiences. They don't, that's what happens when people that can keep gates don't have a vested interest in the art to them. They yeah. can just put somebody else in your place and make the same right. money. Why do they care? It's all the same. And that's where we also start to get back to the whole idea of being culture vultures. Mm -hmm. That like these are people that are that are whitewashing black cultures and presenting primarily white, you know, it's not all white. It's not all white, but primarily white. Yeah. And now because I share genealogy with you, I gotta try to live that down everywhere I go now. Like, you know, or within the within the music stuff, like I got to prove now that I'm not one of those Jews. You know, it's a drag, like it's a drag. We've been working with Zakat Foundation, and I talk about that every episode because they support this podcast, and they're a global humanitarian organization that just gives aid to people who need it. It's an Islamic organization. Uh, they don't only help Muslims, uh, and they don't use their work to proselytize. They work with the people on the ground, in the community, and they deliver stuff to the people that need the stuff. So we're grateful to work with them. And um, right now, the, the Zakat Foundation is focused. They have campaigns in Yemen. They got stuff all over the world, building wells, uh, supporting orphans, feeding people. And it's really dope to work with them because when horrible things happen in the world, the first question is, what can I do? And how do I know that I can actually trust these people? And I mean, I'm not, I'm not in Egypt trying to get stuff over the border, but I've been working with the people at Zakat Foundation for long enough that I trust them and that I trust that they're doing what they say they're doing. And, you know, um, so while they're, while they're struggling to get those trucks over the border to the people of Gaza, and they have had success, uh, I want us to keep those trucks full. Like, that's got to come from somewhere. They're not a government-funded organization. They're funded by people. 
and the chair and the goodness of their hearts, the generosity of people. And so we're good people. The people that listen to us and rock with us are like that. So they're not only helping Muslims and you don't have to be Muslim to be part of the campaign. We're just trying to send food to the people of Gaza. And so $5 sends a meal and supplies there. So hit the links wherever you see them. Go to follow Zakat Foundation online, Zakat US. Uh, you know, hit their website and um, let's do what we can while we can. Manic is, for, I mean, the people haven't heard this one yet, but I mean, this is just a straight celebration of rapping. And I got the two, I got two of my, so like I said, to, to me, it's not interested who your top five is. It's like, who's your top five that's not in other people, that's not in people's top five that should be. And to me, I went to two of the greatest rappers of all time that I know personally. Well, no, you you went to one of them, but I do know Casual. So it's Casual and Aesop Rock. And I set myself up to lose on this record. Like I put myself in a position where, because normally like one of my major strengths where I have an advantage over mo other rappers is when there's something very melo melodic about the beat. Like when there's a when there's a chord progression, when there's a melodic thing, because I know how to deliver the words and the and time them with the music so that it pulls it tugs the heartstrings. That's something I know mm -hmm. that that's a that's an a edge that I have over a lot of rappers. There's no melodic anything in this beat. There's nothing melodic about the beat. Like it's it's literally is that a guitar thing? Going dun, dun, yeah, dun, 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 dun. Remember I sent you the sample. It's like yeah. literally four seconds out of a 12 minute jam session like four seconds loop but it's like it's very aggressive it's very like driving and like it is there's kind of manic. nothing like there's nothing, nothing melodic. melodic about it no you can and so and, and and we gave it to casual first and casual wins the whole album to me like that's the best rapping on the whole out like just but i mean that's what he does like casual <sighs> is he is just an elite MC in terms of his, like, man, multiple meanings, wordplay. I think he's so, like, playful with the flow that, like, people don't realize that, like, he is constantly doing double and triple entendres. Yeah, he's, he, he's another one that you can't imitate him. You could not. There would be no casual impersonation. You know, like... Man, you wouldn't but, get it right. You couldn't get but it. He right. did, but he did say in roundabout 2002, man, this joint he got is called Snagglepuss. Man, Idea, who who passed away, yeah, is one of one of my dearest friends. He loved Casual, and man, he loved West Coast rappers in general. But man, he was really all about Casual and Mike and Nine. And but man, but I remember he showed me this Casual song, and it's funny. But it's like still just such a snaggle puss called a, um called he think he raw, yeah man, man uh. my god if I don't pee the first pimp to put a on the moon go <laughs> Harley I'm riding with a witch and a broom and my dual exhaust is still cooling off you came in your girl's house and my shoes were off and my shirt was off I'm holding my smoke because it hurts to cough she jerked me off she went to Berkeley boss oh my god. <laughs> I knew it from back in the day, from rapping and macking. How that happened this way, man. Dude. I mean, just the just like there's even his early shit is still so brilliant. Like, uh, I always I think about this line like once a day is like, I write raps, full bite, I clap because your shit sounds better now. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, ah, oh, who does yeah, that? Yeah, I write raps, and when you bite, I clap. What? <laughs> yeah, it's just so, it's so perfectly intricate and simple, and it's just everything is exactly perfect. Mm -hmm. And what's dope is that I would say, th so there's four guests on this. None of them are Muslim, but three of the four, the black ones, <laughs> <laughs> they all did something that that shows me that like that showed a level of deference and respect for Islam. Yeah, even, even though they're not Muslim. You know what I mean? So casual, casual is from a like within black consciousness. He's from mm -hmm. a section of of black consciousness that's really big on like uh, like Kemet and Egyptology and uh, religion before Islam. So 
their worldview is not in, in line with the black Muslims. It's not. But the way that he specifically said the things that he, so he put his ideology in there, but he did it in ways that were really precisely never disrespectful to Islam. Whereas he could have said those things in ways that a Muslim would have taken offense to. So it's it's like he is very clearly like putting forward what he believes in a way that's that is still not disrespectful to Islam, that in a way that like could could live on a Brother Ali record and be to totally cool. You know what I mean? Like man, it's really really profound. It's really amazing. And then Quelle Chris says, "I'm not religious, but I'm praying on both knees." <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like that's his way of saying like I'm making salat. You know what I mean? I'm not Muslim, but and then uh, Rock Marcy said, "That's I, I just wanted nourishment, sustenance, ended up with abundance, because that's what that's Allah, what Allah wanted, wanted for beloved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, my God. Did he bar out? Like, yeah, I think man, Rock all, might be Muslim, I think. Is he? I think so. I don't know. I, I mean, there's I no, so. I, I, I know, I believe his name is. Rakim. Yeah. Yeah. Ra. Yeah, no. Nah, um, I've I've never I've I've never had that conversation with him, and I've never seen or heard him speak on it. I mean, I always I always assume that like any New York head from that like hip hop head from that yeah, time man. is at least a five percenter. Yeah, man. I think at he's least in that boat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, like and unless ca somebody and casual, like, mm. casual. I've had you know I've spent a lot of time chopping it up with him. He's what I like about one of the one of the things I like about him is he's. He's not afraid to be wrong. He's like, oh, if I'm wrong, that's great. I just learned something. It's yeah. Like, you know, he's not like, I know everything. You know what I mean? Like, I'd love to be, you know, he's not, he's not afraid of learning and not afraid to be, he's not going in, into debate to crush you. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. But man, Casual's verse is, I mean, I just, I, you know, I walk around singing it to myself all the time. Like ever since he sent it, I'm just like, okay. So he came first, and I was like, all right, brother Ali, this is what you said you wanted. To, this is what you said you wanted. And from the beginning, I was like, when I heard that beat, I was like, it has to be Casual and Aesop. It can't be any two great rappers. For some reason, I've always wanted to put those two on a song. I've always wanted to hear them rap together. And so, so I sent. So at first, Ace was saying that he was finishing his album that came out not that long ago, but we made this out. It took us so long to make this out. It took me so long to like finish the rapping on this record that by the time it came around, he was free again. And so I sent him a uh, casuals verse and he was like, oh my God. All right. And so he came through full Aesop rock, man. Full. And what's deep is like, I, like so for the booklet, like I sat and, and tried to transcribe everything. And casual stuff, there were parts that I, I I just put straight question marks on that actually Brendan went through and filled in. But Aesop, so I hit uh, Kevin Beecham, who's Aesop's a &R guy at Rhyme Sayers, and I was like, hey, I got Aesop for this verse. He already gave me the verse. Uh, I didn't go through the label. I just went directly to Ace. Uh, I did tell Ace, like, this isn't coming out on Rhyme Sayers. He did know that. But I asked Kevin, I was like, hey, is there any chance maybe Aesop might? Can I send you what I wrote? And three minutes later, he was like, oh, Aesop has all of his verses written and cataloged. So you can ask oh, him wow. for something and he will text it to you immediately. Like he knew it. He sent it to me within minutes. Yeah. And his stuff, I mean, his verse is incredible. incredible. He's just elite level MC. So then I had to just like try to keep up with these dudes, man. I'm like- You did. Like you- I. You won. I don't know, man. I think you won because you barred out too, man. I, I did okay. I did good. I'm, I feel <laughs> there's certain songs where like, okay, so I'm on a song with Scarface. He, he didn't get to hear mine before I did it. Like I heard his and then I built it into a song. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I feel like, okay, I'll leave it for, I'll leave it for Chuck D or somebody to say who won, but, but I didn't lose. I'll just say that. You know what I mean? I'm on a, I'm on songs with Freeway. I'm like, like these elite guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm on a song. I'm on a song with Wale. I'm pretty comfortable with it. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of these type of folks that I'm on songs with. I haven't done one with Black Thought yet. Um, 
But then there are some of them where I'm like, okay, I didn't get killed. Like Pharaoh, <laughs> Pharaoh came through and that, that Pharaoh won. You know what I mean? But I didn't get I crushed. Mean. I I held my own next to Pharaoh. You know what I'm saying? And he's gonna be here this week. Ah, uh, man, I love I'm Pharaoh, man. He's one of the most. He he act like he doesn't know he's Pharaoh much. I love people like that. Oh, he, like God, he just thinks he's a rapper. He's like, yeah, I'm a rapper. So and so's a rapper. So and so's a rapper. We are we're all rappers. Like we're all just trying to figure out how to rap. And like, man. You, yeah, but you're feral much. Like yeah, you're not exactly. you're not just an MC. You are you're an alien. You're different. Black folks the same way. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Chuck D's the same way. There's like a lot of these guys, it's like they don't even realize that they're not like the rest of us. Like, man, <laughs> you are a different animal. Right. So yeah, but man, th this one I'm like, man, I feel good about it. Casual one, uh, that's it's like blatantly obvious to me. Casual wins, but that's what I wanted. Not that I could, not that I didn't try my hardest either. I'm not like, yeah, I let casual win. Like, no, casual um, won because he's casual. <laughs> like to me, that's the verse of the. That's the verse of the album. That's a pretty good one. My wife loves that song. Yeah, Nam de Plume. Um. This is one of the only beats that was not that I got off of vinyl. The samples okay. from vinyl. The okay. Only, the only one, I think. Because, yeah, most of them are from like public service announcement films for kids from the yeah, 70s most, and 80s. Yep. 60s, 70s, and 80s children's pro social uh, films. Dope. <laughs> yeah, so dope. I love it. So yeah, Nam de Plume is um I mean it's just a hard rap song, but I'm still talking about spiritual stuff. And I sampled Imam Worth Dean Muhammad. Um, one of my favorite just moments of his, just like a really just that's from a private uh meeting that he was doing. Like we would go to these conferences and conventions with him. That's the son of Elijah Muhammad. So basically that was the split, like Minister Farrakhan and Worth Dean Muhammad par parted ways about which way the community should go. And like religiously and spiritually and everything. So my teacher was Imam Warthi Muhammad. And um, he's in this like, he would do these big conferences every year, usually around Memorial Day and, um, or no, Labor Day, Labor Day weekend. And there'd be like big addresses and stuff, but then he'd have these like private meetings with his imams or like he'd have a meeting just with like women organizers, just men. And there's one with just men and he's like, people saying, oh, uh, we don't want to hear this. And he's like, well, leave. And he's talking to his biggest funders mm. and because they didn't like some of the new direction he was taking. And he just yelled at them. I'm not asking for you for a damn thing. Do you understand that? Oh I don't need anything from anybody. Allah has given me more than I need. He said, uh, you know, I can, I can, my stomach can be filled to satisfaction and I can lay down with the alley dogs. He's like, uh, you know, I'm not caring about you you know you can't give me money into my heart and my mind. I I'm not caring about my wow. stomach. I care about my heart, my mind. This is a him in life, talking to his biggest funders. And it's just this moment that like just got captured. You know, what I I'm had saying? no idea. I had no idea. That makes you know. I've heard you know. I've listened to that song many times. I had no idea who he was speaking to. The fact that he was speaking to his his financiers and funders. Yeah. That's inspiring. So, that makes me want to go to work tomorrow and do the same thing. So so this is the person who he's the son of Elijah Muhammad, the honorable Elijah Muhammad. When Elijah Muhammad passed away or departed, as the nation of Islam says, he inherited the nation of Islam. He then decentralized all the businesses. He said, Stop sending your money to Chicago. He never lit he didn't live in the mansion that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad lived in. Uh, he disbanded the FOI. And so the people that follow Minister Farrakhan, they view these things as like he destroyed the nation of Islam. And I'm saying, I wasn't there that, you know, they, those they, those communities reunited. And so it's a beautiful thing to me. I was really happy the communities reunited. I love the nation of Islam, not a member, um, you know. So, and he went for Sunni traditional Orthodox Islam that was still very culturally black. Um, you know, and he did, he was a controversial person. They tried to kill him, not not the Nation of Islam, but people, some people tried to assassinate him. But basically, he inherited this position where he could have amassed tremendous wealth and been at the helm of all this wealth. And he basically said, "You run your own businesses. Stop sending your money to Chicago." You know what I mean? Um, 
he basically dismantled the army that was at his fingertips. Um, so like, because he didn't think it was the right way to keep going. You know what I mean? And so, and constantly throughout his career as the imam, he would resign from his own organization <laughs> and stop taking their money. And basically like, I don't want your checks. I don't want, you know what I mean? You don't own me. Nobody owns me. You know, that was one of the big things about him is that he really believed like Allah. Matter of fact, one time there was a story that came out after Prince passed away where Prince knew about all of this and Prince stepped to him and gave him a big amount of money and was like, this isn't for the movement. This is for you to take your family on vacation. And he did wow. it. Wow. He was like, because Prince said this was for my, he was like, this isn't for you. This is for your wife, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your nieces and nephews. You take your whole family. And so he took his family to Puerto Rico. <laughs> That's dope. <laughs> yeah. Because because Prince is like, I know that you've walked away from all this power and money and, you know. Yeah. Wow. So that that's what that speech is. I'm not asking you for a damn thing. Do you understand that? And he's someone like I knew him. You know what I mean? Like right. So that's okay. particularly. I love that. Oh man, that's a powerful yeah. song. It's a it's a self proclamation song. It's like self assurance. Like you know. Yeah. This is me. Yeah, and it basically is me saying like I no longer have any as a rapper. Like I no longer have, I no longer have the need to like brag or like assert myself. But my message and what I represent, that's what that song is. And that's why I say nom de plume, because it's like, it doesn't matter who the person is. Like nom de plume is like when a writer writes, you already know this, but like yeah, yeah. when a writer writes under a different name, kind of like Doom with the mask, where it's like, it's not about who's behind this. It's not about me. It's about the work. And so what I'm, what I'm saying there is like, it's not about me. It's about the message and like what I represent. You know what I'm saying? But Absolutely. so so there is a lot of like gravitas around that message and what it represents. That's important. People so, need yeah. that message to you know people. We'll get to this in a second, but people need things to make them feel confident. Yeah, and like and and yeah, confidence is good. But like, what are we confident about? We're confident about virtue. We're confident about truth. We're confident about sacrificing for what's right. We're confident about being warriors for love and being willing to mm -hmm. sacrifice. And that's why I say, you know, uh, Fatima Zahra Sayyidina Hussein, goosebumps on my frame just to mention their names. You know, they didn't kill him just because they did away with the demon monsters, freed the martyr on the day that he fell. They didn't kill him just because they did away with his shell. Like, man, you just free us from our earthly shell. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, if they if 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 you don't want to put my record out. If you culture vultures don't want to put my record out, you freed me from being in business with some white devil culture vulture snakes. If you're scared of the truth that I'm telling, you shouldn't put my record out. Right, my record right. has no business, just like Muhammad Ali's business has has no business being next to an alcohol company. Or this record has no business on your on your little platform. True. You know what I'm saying? If they mm -hmm. fire you from your job, that that I mean. You know, they then they have yeah they don't absolutely then the, I shouldn't be there. If, but I, I mean I mean here truth. here here here's to hoping that you work anywhere you want for as long as you want. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. Look, anything that is good that comes from me or comes out of me is from God, and God is undefeated. If if I got tattoos, <laughs> if I was a man, anything that comes from me is from God, and God is undefeated. Man, we could just, just, why why still talk? All right, Cadillac. Yeah. Woo, Cadillac. Yeah. yeah, Cadillac is one of those songs that I mean I've said it, but like I I always needed to tell that story, and it's just it, you can't do it until it's right. And I there's just something about that music that I was like, oh, now's the time. Hmm. So, I want to say that was the third song we did, or third or fourth. That when you sent that over, that's when that's when I knew that we were that we were going to make an album. That's mm -hmm. when I knew that we were making an album. It was never. I just I don't even think that was anywhere on our radar for a while. I was just we're just working. 
you know, just working yeah. collaboratively, like somebody new, cool to work with that, you know, that seems to be, you know, that it's working out. But when that song came through, I was like, oh, we got it. We're doing an album. This is a project. This is. Yeah. This, this is a statement. Is the, this is a this moment. Is a statement. It's a yeah. moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When we did the first song, and you sent me all those beats, I, I think we always knew we were going to do a, a little body of work. But I think we both yeah. kind of thought like we're going to make an EP, and that this will be fun. This will be a fun, different thing. But yeah, at some point it was like, no, this I'm the, I'm actually this is this is different. This is not this is a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Gauntlet is the one with Rock Marcy. So <sighs> man, this is a major like to have Rock Marcy on this record is, I mean, he is the emblematic like and he's earned every single every single penny he's ever made every accolade he's ever received i mean i saw him chilling with jay-z it's like yeah that's where you should be like he is an elite royal he's royalty he's you know but he's a, he, he he is a legitimate icon he's the, he is the the most influential person in our world in the last 15 years like Absolutely. you know, um, and another person, he knows he's Rock Marciano. Let me not, but he answers the phone. Yeah, you know, yeah, he is, yeah. He's a so. I met him uh, in 2011 or 2010. Casual introduced us. I did the video for I did like and I shot and directed the whole thing too. It wasn't animated for um, Emeralds. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like the kind of the moment of his reemergence of like claiming that's like his first. I don't say his first, but that's like his one of the major parts of the times of his reemergence into prominence. Um, yeah. yeah, that was one of and, his big uh, moments. And we were hanging out, hanging out a lot at that time. Like he was he was in the Bay living, but didn't really, you know, know anybody or have any way around. So we were just hanging out. We go record shopping, clothes shopping. He taught me, you know people come in your life for a reason to teach you things and teach you lessons. And I learned a lot from him. Um, I learned a lot from him about value and establishing value and living up to it and having it work, like setting your price, knowing your worth. Yeah. Like I learned a lot of, aside from having just my mind blown by just a completely new conceptual way to make this music that we love. Yeah. Like when I heard, I was with him when he was making some of the beats on Rosebud's Revenge. And I remember thinking like, this is, what is this? This is nothing. Like, what is he even doing? Yeah. And then I heard the song with right. him rapping on it. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a genius at work. Yes. Who is rethinking the entire craft. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, he's he is in the conversation with Dilla and Doom, like that's the that's the conversation. Those are the people and Madlib. Those are the people that made me feel that when I first was introduced to them. Like, wow, I had no, and, and I, I'm them. getting goosebumps because that's the feeling that I, as a hip hop fiend, yeah. that's the feeling that I fiend for. Yeah, is that discovery of like, oh, I didn't know you could do that with it. Oh my yeah. god, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the last time that something changed that radically it was was dilla and mm -hmm. and and doom you know and you could also say like certain things like with the soul samples you know what i mean so there that you could uh, you could say that too but yeah i mean and he's one of the people that it's interesting that he's named rakim because rakim is this way and asap rocky is also named rakim that's his, also his name and mm -hmm. he's this way too so all three of these people are this way there's like a, you know, Rakim, like he looks like an Egyptian pharaoh or something. Like he looks like royalty. Like he looks like a king. And he behaves like a regal, royal, benevolent king. Like he's giving and generous in a way that's just extremely and profoundly like regal. You know what I mean? Not that he mm -hmm. thinks he's better than anybody. He's never elevating. He's not elevating himself over anybody else. His like intrinsic dignity and virtue and just his regality is elevating him. 
Like his actual royalty is elevating him. You know what I mean? Like this, like, you know, the music we grew up on and like the language that we grew up on is black people insisting like we descend from kings. And there's certain people that when you see them, you're like, this is absolutely true. This is right. absolutely true. And that's why somebody like Rock Marciano knows that he's supposed to be wearing that. Like, right, it's like, that's what he said. It's like, yeah, that, that this is not, it's different than somebody putting on an outfit. It's different than somebody trying to just be flashy or, or you know, whatever. There's something about like when Yasin Bey put something on, it's just different. Mm -hmm. It's just different, you know what I mean? And it it does come from like a very regal, royal thing. And man, Rock has that, man. Like he is it. It's not even something that you do. You can't emulate it. It can't be taught. Like he genuinely has that. Like it's in his, it's in his genetic past. Like you're talking about, yeah, man, it's so beautiful. Yeah, and he, he... He did not phone in his verse. He no, gave us a that could have been a song in and of itself. Like right. what he get, what he get, and he gave it to you. I mean, we have exchanged messages, and he's always been so respectful and just beautiful. And you know, I've messaged him out of the blue and just like, hey man, I just have so much respect for what you do. And I mean, he just gave it right back, like so, like peace, king, and all that stuff. But man, he did that for you. Like I could hear in that. But he threw some stuff about Islam in there, you know what I mean? That I'm like, oh, this is him being respectful, you know what I mean? But he did that for you. And yeah, I mean, that could have so been- a hard. That's so hard for me to like, it's hard for me to fathom and grasp really, like, truly. Like, yeah, someone like Paris saying I'm a fan or someone like Rock valuing me. Yeah. I'm like, wow, wow. Like, it's not like I would go why or anything, but I'm just like, that's amazing and humbling. It's one of those moments I have to be still with. Rock called me yesterday and sent me the new record. Mm. Um, and he was like, I, he was like, you, Alchemist, and Jay Z have this. I'm just like, what? And like, I, I, I really have to be still with that. Like, cause, yeah. cause I'm going to be, I'm going to do a little, I'm going to, I'm going to do some work for the new record, some animation work for the new record, but he called me to be like, Hey, I'm about to send you this record. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, and I want you to do the, you know, I got a couple ideas for animation and he's like, but you know, he and I, he and I have spent a lot of like real life time together, like aside from music and aside from art. And um, he's someone that he knows, he knows that if he needs me, I am there. Yeah. And 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 he's shown up time and time again for me in ways that far exceed what he needed to do. Like it's just something I got to be still with because we do have a really great relationship. And, uh, and that man, just, that's a bad man. That is a bad man. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's a beautiful. Mm. We talk a lot about therapy and there actually is a major demand for therapists right now. The, the demand is greater than the actual amount of therapists because the times we live in are really not natural. We're living lives that I don't think our hearts and our bodies and our minds and our uh, souls and our, I don't think we're built for this. I think we're living extremely trying times. The human condition and the world we live in is just a struggle anyway. Like that's naturally the case. But I think that there are some self-imposed things that we as a species are just doing to ourselves and each other that's really, really trying. And so the same way that our bodies need to eat certain types of food and the same way that we you know, deserve to have some guidance and some assistance with all parts of our lives, Talking to a therapist is a really unique thing, and I knew about it for a long time. Honestly, it took me a long time to actually do it, and it's partially because I was judging it, you know what I mean? But a lot of that judgment just came from fear of the unknown. 
And it's not mostly what I didn't know was the secrets I was keeping from myself. And I was scared to uncover that. I wouldn't have admitted that to myself, but that's the kind of insight you have in therapy. And you talk through it with a person whose job is to guide us through asking questions of ourselves and in like, like letting us into our own thinking. There's so much, there are so many secrets I kept from myself. There are so much of my own thinking that I hadn't really fully examined. And I'm just really very grateful to have been able to open those doors with someone who knows how to guide me through those things so that they're not violent, you know, re-traumatizing situations. Like I, I was able to do it in the place that felt really safe to me. And part of that with, I and I did it on better health. And part of what's so good about it is that you can change your therapist every week until you find a person that feels good to you. No questions asked, nobody's funny about it. Um, it's a really, it's a great program, especially for people who are starting therapy. Um, is it perfect? No. If you have insurance and you have a therapist office in your neighborhood where you can go and talk to somebody in person, that's probably better. I'm not supposed to, maybe I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not, but it's true. But most of us don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have a job and I don't live in America. And so I don't have insurance and I don't, you know. So for me, it's better help. And it's, it helped me so much that we actually reached out to them and said, hey, can we start a, a relationship where we make our listeners and viewers aware of what you do? So if you go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, uh, you'll be able to get a discount on your first month. They also give us a little something. It's not crazy money, but they give us a little something and it helps, uh, it helps us do this show. It helps us do this podcast. Um, and with both of our partnerships, BetterHelp and the Zakat Foundation, I'm grateful that we haven't just taken any and every sponsorship. We're not just selling you stuff like this is stuff that's good for humanity and it's good for us. So check out betterhelp.com slash travelers. So the next one is Howlin' Wolf. Howlin' Wolf is the first song we did. Yep. Love that song. I still think that's like one of my favorite. Like I still I I want to see a crowd that knows that song get loose to that song just because it feels like a party. I hope you're right. I <laughs> I don't think you are, but I hope you're right. I know the crowd. Yes, you but do. I, yes, but you I've do. been wrong. I've been wrong before, and like plenty of times, I think they're going to respond to stuff and they don't. So, but I I hope you're right. So yeah, that was the first song that I recorded and moving to Istanbul so that there's a booth in me back here in this space and um yeah it's the first first song I recorded that was the one like when we when I hit you up and you sent me beats and I, I heard that and I was like okay I'm, I'm just gonna walk I'm just gonna and honestly I was kind of thinking about evidence when I made that one because mm. I remember evidence saying like you want the beat to have space and then you also want to give space you want the beat to give space for you and you give space for the beat. And mm. I just was hearing, I just will rewatch the Quincy Jones documentary that's on Netflix. And he was saying, you always leave space for God in your work. You don't fill up everything. So he's like, you know, each element puts something in, but you leave space in, leave space for God to come in the room. So, yeah. And then that was the first video you did too. And I was just like, man, that's. Yeah. I mean, and that's another thing that when you talk about like you giving me permission to put my whole self into it, my, my cousin was, you know, who I'm not close with, but is a sweet girl. Mm. Um, she's like in her twenties, um, happened to go to art school and is this amazing illustrator, but also happens to have an enormous affinity for wolves. So wow. like, just I didn't another, know that like, part. Yeah, no. So she actually went to art school, but then went to vet school to be a wolf veterinarian. So, and I'd seen her draw wolves. So when this song came back, I was like, can you draw me some wolves? I'll pay you to draw some wolves. She was like, sure. I'm drawing wolves right now. What do you need? Like, Cause that's all she did was draw wolves. But the fact that like about, again, about this record, my family's on this record. My mom yes. did calligraphy yes. for the, for the jacket artwork. Yes. My, you know, my cousin did these wolf illustrations. Like this is a lot of me. You're, mm -hmm. You have been so gracious. I, I sometimes I'm like, you know, 
I got to be the most who cares guest to ever appear on this podcast. <laughs> but like, you've given me so much room to tell my story and to, to share of myself that I'll never be able to thank you enough. It's a beautiful thing, man. So then we go to ghosts. So I, uh, full disclosure, I have to be out of here in 18 minutes. All good. Because we got to start fasting. I got to go wake <laughs> my family up to start fasting. It's 4.45 oh in the morning here. Oh, my God. But this is, I'm on Ramadan schedule. It's all good. Okay. Um, Dang, thanks for doing this, man. No, thank you. So uh, ghosts. Ghosts is interesting. So I don't think I ever told you this, but ghosts I did as a brother minister thing. Like the, you know, mm. I do those like, uh, yeah, yeah. I like make a beat, spit something to it. Like I don't think about it. I just do it all in one session, and so I actually started that. That's a, the the beginning of that song was happening over a brother minister thing, and I was like, no, this I'm not gonna waste this top. This is another song that like, because I've been ghosted in the last since I'm coming here, and it freaking it hurts. Like when somebody just, you know what I'm saying? When you're friends with somebody and then they just disappear from your life and they don't even really tell you why. You know what I mean? It's so messed up that your life, disappearing from your life can be disappearing from this, you know? Yeah. And I actually was thinking about Jay-Z saying, I got numbers in my phone that I'll never ring again because Allah called them home. You know what I mean? Like, the, mm. like there's people in our phone that die. And then there's people in our phone that we just don't talk to anymore for what, for whatever reason, you know what I mean? And, um, but they're, they're both kind of like a death that we, they have to be mourned. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like, if somebody dies, it's like, well, that's what happens in life. There's like, there's an acceptance to death. That's right. harder when somebody just abandons you in life. There's Which no is closure. why I was saying like with these people that like, I went, I was going to go forgive them. And I realized like, no, I abandon you. You know what I'm saying? But there's people that abandon me, and I have no idea why. Like I, I, like I don't know why. But it's like, it's almost like they died, and I never even got an a, an announcement. I never even got the phone call. Hey, so and so died. Right. No, there's they, no closure. No. It's and it's really tough. So, yeah. So that's what that song is. When people hear the music, and the music sounds so like. How would you describe that music? It's so weird. Like that is a weird ass beat. I don't even remember where I my source material, but uh, it's kind of like it feels like a pep rally. Like it feels so like some kind of like. But it's like electro. It's like an electro funk <laughs> pep rally. Because it's it's <laughs> like it's got eight oh eights in it and like yeah. And like and like a, a really like a like a wooden like, clav. Do, 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 yeah, do, do. And like, but it's all like synth. It sounds like the SOS band, like playing a pep rally or something. Uh, and then Quelle uh, Chris got on it. Man, Quelle Quelle Chris is another one of those guys, man. That like people do not give him the crap. But like with all these guys, so like everybody knows the people that listen to Rock Marcy know that he's like Andre three thousand level MC. Or like mm -hmm. just creative. Like I don't even know if like MC isn't enough of a term. It's like no, he does a lot more. Yeah, it's like and and it's the kind of the whole thing. It's not just his rapping. It's like his whole vision. It's an entire vision. It's a way of being a creative. Thousand percent. Thousand percent. But yeah, I mean, so like, so everybody that knows that about him sees him that way. So to say he doesn't get the credit reserved, like in his with the people that get it, get it. But when people talk top five. The fact that Rock Marcy's name isn't in it is just so crazy. Or like the fact that Kanye can say, I invented all the trends in the last 20 years. You ain't had nothing to do with Rock Marciano. Quelle is the same type of person. Like, yeah, right. He's so brilliant. Like, that feeling I was saying of like realizing, like, oh, you can do this with it. Yeah. I, he was one of those people for me too. And I met him through Rock. I met okay. him through Rock. Oh, I didn't Oakland. know that. Okay. Yeah, I met him through Rock in Oakland, and he was working on a album with Chris Keys, uh, yeah. "Innocent Country" too. And I was just, I was lucky to be in the studio with him, and I was just so blown away by that project. But also, you need to know about Quelle Chris, and I can't say this loud enough. I I work with and I hire animators, motion designers all the time. 
Quelle Chris is the best person besides me I've ever met. He is a fantastic. I I still might hire him to animate ghosts. Like oh, that'd he, be dope. He's that good. He's the only person I've been able to hand work off to, because people don't, you know. And I've been able to subcontract to him, and they they're like, this is just as dope as I expected. Like he is as good as me with that stuff, and um, I have just so much respect. When I'm around him, I feel like I'm around my like my tribe. My tr- I'm like. This is a creative dude that gets it on all the levels. Yeah, his animation is insane. He, you know, Paris is the hardest client I've ever had. Mm. And I gave one of my two, I gave two, he had me do like seven videos. I gave two of them to Quelle and he killed him mm. in a different style than what he would do too. Like he's able to achieve, as a designer, you have to be able to achieve any style. Yeah. You can't just, and he can, and I can't say it loud enough. Like, if you're not messing with me on the animation, you need to be messing with Quelle and vice versa. Like he is the truth with that stuff. That's dope. Yeah. That's man. dope. I knew he did it and I knew that his videos are dope. But I never no. really I like I wasn't holding that him in that in that space. You know what's crazy is on the mic, I mean, he's just incredible. And we talk about people making music just for themselves. Like, man, mm. this guy is forever. Like it sounds like he's doing what makes him laugh and yes. he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't like telegraph his dopeness he's not like he, he's not doing anything with his voice to be like and this is the dopest rhyme ever <laughs> you know what i mean he's just casually yeah. saying the illest stuff you know what i mean like yeah. man the way that he came in on this track and it's very sad because this is a sad song but yes. it, it, it's very sad but the music is playful and I always like I learned that from Ant, like an an atmosphere, you know, d- take a playful music and do something really dark on it. Take dark music, do something really ho- bright and hopeful on it. That's one of their big uh, things. Uh, um, yeah, I can see that. I can totally see that. That's one of the things that they that they really do. But man, yeah, he's so it's like the the words he's saying are playful, and he's using really playful language, but it's very sad. Yeah, it's and really his, his his intonation. He's like you know. Almost in times dipping into being a child. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah. These lions, tigers, dope. and bears out here like Jamon. Jamon, <laughs> somebody me. I want somebody that needs me, somebody that flaunts me. Yeah, man, he, it's incredible. Yeah, he's a great person. He's one of my favorite people. A okay. Forever. So yeah, love and service. The title track. <sighs> this this song and the video that goes with it is. You know, uh, that's the, basically it's about cancel culture. Um, it's about you know what it is for people to to do a public call out of people that they're in community with, and this is something that I lived through. is one of the most painful experiences of my life. Even though, like I say, that nobody said I was canceled, but also you know they it wasn't aimed at me. It's not like I got canceled, but the effect didn't feel much different. And it was for, it was about issues that I have focused on and centered in my career and done a lot of work around. And it really, like, it really felt like, not necessarily that, like, even if I wasn't targeted, it really felt like the community of artists in the Twin Cities, um, like mutually, and it was almost like a mutual agreement that we're all going to abandon each other that we're going to stop being a community. You know what I mean? That there basically what it descended into was basically everybody distancing themselves and uh, making posts and statements, distancing themselves from each other. Uh, I think there was an attempt to have a conversation around the way that artists treat women, which is really important. Um, but it was it, that conversation never happened. Um, you know, there was no... Yeah, it was just really one of the one of the saddest things that I've ever been a part of and have, and ever ever witnessed. Not just for myself personally, but I'm just like, where is the, what is this community going to be after this? What's this community? And it, because that tw- the Twin Cities music scene did see itself as a community, and I always had my questions about it, and I always had my suspicions, 
but it really during the time of covid where nobody was in space together anymore rhyme sayers closed their their uh, physical brick and mortar store which was a center for community stuff and they also stopped doing their festival so the two things that rhyme said two of the like very physical present things where artists could benefit from a force like rhyme sayers being in town were no longer there and people weren't in space with each other anymore. And, you know, and basically all of this anger and all this stuff got aimed at Rhyme Sayers. And it was during the time when I was quietly stepping away from Rhyme Sayers because of my own issues. You know what I mean? And I wasn't going to announce that to people and say like, hey, the things that you're mad at them about, I didn't have any power over that. I wasn't going to do that. And I wasn't going to say, hey, I'm actually on my way to building my own platform because I don't. You know what I mean? I didn't. And so, so all that to say, to be able to make the song, the song, like there's certain songs in my life where like, this is a big enough theme where I making the song is the healing. And it's what let me know that I, that I've healed. I'm not mm. carrying this pain anymore. So when you talk about cathartic art, you know, I'm not carrying this pain anymore. This is how I feel. You can play this four minute song and it's exactly what I think. Nothing else needs to be taken away or added. This is exactly what I think. And if if someone were to say, what does Ali think about this? That's, that is it, hmm. you know? And so then one of the things I said, so people are, haven't seen this video yet, but I said, one of the things is, um, uh, uh, will will we do better with our thumbs than the pigs did with their guns? You know, the idea of like, you know, if we have a power, we have a platform um, on Twitter or on in social media or whatever, and people are listening to us, will we be more just to each other than what the police system is? Because you start thinking about like, where's the due process? Where's the part where people get to face their accusers? Where's the part where people are innocent until proven guilty? Where's the part where, you know what I mean? Like if someone, was, and I wasn't accused of anything, but if someone was accused of something, do they have a real opportunity to really even talk that through, mm -hmm. you know? And so you made this beautiful video where everyone in the video are thumbs and i'll just i'll let you take it away i'm sorry we don't have a whole lot of time but it, like to me this is the one that this is the one this i mean worthy is is great is a favorite of mine too but yeah i mean i love um human when i do animations i love humanizing things that you wouldn't normally think mm -hmm. like you know turning a thumb into a person you know yeah. what i mean yeah. it just takes you out of the realm of reality and it lets you allows you to be more receptive to new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I have to give a shout out for this one to um, a good friend of mine, Kasim Green, who is my favorite illustrator. And it's not because he's so good. Like I said, if you're really an illustrator and you're really going to live off it, you got to be able to hit a bunch of different styles. And he can. He can hit all the clean corporate styles. He can do logos. He can hit all those styles. But his illa style and my favorite illustration style i think of anyone that i know of is when he's just sketching mm. i've tried to get him to do it for other things and he's like i can't i have to chew on it and digest it and have it in my brain for like a year before he's like so while when you sent me that song he was just posting sketches of of hands wow and i'm like yo i started a screenshot i'm like i need more hands can you give me some more hands I was like, can you just draw me a bunch of hands? I'm doing a video with the hand with where hands are people. And he was like, yeah, I'm doing it right now. You know? So I, I got mad love for Kasim and um, he's so talented. My favorite illustrator, my favorite. And I know a lot. I know a hundred illustrators. He's my favorite. And that style of his is my favorite. And I'm so glad that I, we got to incorporate that into a video because the video is so powerful at con conveying how, broken our uh system of digital community is and like yeah. you said you know no judge or jury nothing like that yeah man and just the the it it really conveys like the, the, the we approach the song and the video with a deep empathy for everybody involved with like a deep loving for everyone involved for i mean 
I mean, there are people that did come after me, you know, the, the, you know, there was a, like, so the idea was like, well, we got to, we got to get rid of rhyme sayers. Well, the, mm. the problem with that is, well, what about Ali? And so people were like, well, Ali lied and said he was black, which is not true, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine sitting with, uh, you know, criticism about that. You know what I mean? Like that's anything around that subject. I'm like, yeah, but you know what I mean? Um, there was a person in particular who I knew and helped at multiple stages in his career. And he's not black, by the way, but he was the main <laughs> one that like, you know, misquoted lyrics of mine and like really came for me directly. He was the only person that really came for me. And even while it was going on, I'm like, man, what is the pain going on inside this person? You know what I mean? That he's he's raging at me of all people. And I like really... I can I can point to very specific things that I did to help this person, you know, and he's always had my phone number. And it's like I've known him for 15 years. How long have you felt this way? Right. And why have you never said anything to me? You know what I mean? Why have you never if you really thought that I was harming the culture or if you thought that I was doing something that was harmful, why have you never said anything to me? You know? And you just continued to smile in my face and benefit from me and then the second you got a chance to do this. But even in that time, I'm like, man, the pain that people are in, mm. even if this doesn't, even if I don't think it's justified that it applies to me or to my friends or to rhyme series or whatever, this pain does exist. And this pain is real. Even, even if I don't think that this particular um, expression of it is helpful, you know what I mean? Like the, this pain is real. And, um, it's just a very sad thing. And the only way to, to remedy it is to acknowledge the humanity of everybody involved and say, it's all just love and service. If not, then what's the purpose? Like what we're here to do with each other is love and serve. Yeah, man, it's a beautiful, like, you know, I think this was like the second, was this the second song? Yes. Second song. Yep. And this is the one that I actually sat down and wrote. And then after that, we have Worthy and the song inside so worthy is um your video showing up saying we ch saying change oh, oh, the battery oh. bank okay my uh my camera died we've been at this four and a half hours yeah bro it felt i mean it felt like nothing though yeah it felt like nothing. yeah man so i i think we can <laughs> i like i literally gotta go home and start frying eggs yeah we got two we got two we got i think we got two episodes worth maybe we'll see it's good that we got something like a heart out. We got to wrap it up. But I love you, man. Love you uh, so much, Ali. This, uh, this process and just everything has been so beautiful. It's so much more than just music. Absolutely. Love you, man. I love you, brother. Special thanks to my man, Just Unjust, Justin, um, just for really sharing himself in these conversations and in this music that we made together. He's one of these people that's just kind of a un, a, an uncovered gem. He's like one of the best kept secrets of the, of the hip hop community, you know? And I'm really, I feel good to be aligned with him. And I, I'm, the project that we made together feels really good to me. We made what we wanted to make and we healed while making it. Um, we bonded while making it. This is like, this is why you want to be an independent artist. And so it'd be really cool if you supported it. <laughs> it'd be really cool if we sold all the vinyl we made. You know what I mean? Honestly, like to be, just to keep it 1000 with you, we got to sell our first initial, um, we got to sell all the vinyl that we pressed just to get our money back that we put into this album. That's how it works. You know what I mean? So if you would like to support and also, if you want to own, like, it's not like you're just donating money. Uh, what you get in return is a piece of art that two people that have dedicated our lives to this really feel like, man, this is the best document that we could have made of this really pivotal uh, period in our lives. We're talking about the pandemic coming into this moment now. So thank you for being here for it. Thanks for being part of this journey. Special thanks to Unjust. Special thanks to uh, the uh, Zakat Foundation and to BetterHelp. Uh, Travis Podcast is produced by BK1. Thank you, BK1. We gave him over four hours of stuff that he 
had to like go through to to try to make these episodes that we, <laughs> would be cool for you to listen to. We're always very grateful. And to everybody that listens to the podcast and gives us feedback, it really means a lot. So uh, shout out to everybody that listens to the podcast. We love you all. We'll see you next week. We got another dope guest next week, inshallah. And um, I'm still going to be in Africa, but we got another dope guest next week, so make sure you're here. We love you all beyond words. Blessed Ramadan, blessed Eid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.